tell you one thing, that mask does not do your lipstick right. No, it does not. We are on too, just so you know. Oh, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> No, that's probably the biggest complaint for women. <laughs> I didn't do the timer. Wait, how much time? About less than a minute. Less than a minute, we'll be going. We'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine on time. Okay. It's probably three hours. Mm mm. Good. Okay, so we're starting with Shantae. Okay. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I am Mayor Chastity Wells Armstrong. I want to apologize. We were scheduled to start at 7:30, and we were having some technical difficulties. So, if you are tuning in, um, I encourage you to invite your friends and family, neighbors, and everybody to 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 get on and, and, and engage with us tonight during this very important presentation and conversation. Um, I want to introduce uh, the National League of Cities. We are having a special interview on race, equity, and leadership. If you observe City Council on Monday, um, I introduced the NLC team um, during City Council to talk a little bit about the work of NLC. So I just want, um, everyone to be open-minded and this is an opportunity for all of us to learn and figure out solutions that get to the root causes of violence and some of the other things that we see in our communities that bring us harm. So I will start with a quote. James Baldwin once stated, quote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced, end of quote. So again, we are hosting a special interview tonight to discuss race, equity, and more as we continue to navigate not only a pandemic, but racial tension nationwide. So joining us as my guests tonight are Leon Andrews, who's the Director of Racial Equity and Leadership with the National League of Cities, and Shante Byers, who is the Senior Executive and Director of Member and Partner Engagement for NLC. You also will see uh, Kathy Carter, who's joining um, the NLC team for technical support, so we want to thank her for being here as well. Both are strong advocates, both Leon and Shante, who continue to work to implement change, educate, and train to better enhance our communities nationwide. Ms. Byers will start us off this evening, and Mr. Andrews is going to join us a little later. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Shante, and I want to thank you for joining me. And if you can begin with telling us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely, Mayor. Thank you so much for, for having me, for having Leon, for having Kathy, and, and uh, allowing us to you know engage with your community. We truly appreciate this. And I guess to, to start off telling you just a, a little bit about myself, um, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, but I grew up in Elkhart, Indiana, so that's not too far away. So I want y'all to know I'm Midwest through and through, <laughs> all day, every day. And the reason why I think I started there telling you a little bit about myself is because uh, I think the way that I grew up, my father more specifically, is the reason why I really have a passion for not only just social justice, but making sure that you know I am an active participant in helping to build communities. And it's something that I saw in him every day of my life. And because of that, I think that's one of the reasons why I was drawn you know, to the work uh, of the National League of Cities, because I saw a very clear, direct way of being able to work with communities across the country to do just that, to kind of help community build and to talk about those tough issues and challenges and try to help to find solutions and problems. Uh, because I very much believe that we were put here on this earth to make a difference, no matter where we are, no matter what our sphere of influence. And that was drilled in me at a very young age. And, and that led me to NLC and to the work of NLC. Okay. So what is the NLC? 
Absolutely. Well, the NLC, also known as the National League of Cities, we are the largest and the oldest national uh, national association for local government. So what that means is we are the oldest organization that works directly with cities, towns, and villages from across the country, and we are the largest. And so we do a whole host of different things. We work with cities uh, directly to help them with technical assistance on various issues that they may be facing every single day. We help to build a network across the country of mayors and council members so they have peer support so they can work together to find best practices for example, whatever may be happening in Kankakee, if there's something in Elkhart, Indiana that we can connect you with as a resource, we want to make sure that we can do those types of things. In addition to that, we definitely advocate wholeheartedly with all of our heart at the federal level to ensure that cities like Kankakee can get the proper funding from the federal government so that you can do the things necessary, build your roads, build your infrastructure, connect with your communities. And then lastly, we really pride ourselves in saying, hey, we want to find solutions, savings and solutions. So how can we help cities who are oftentimes asked to do so much more with less? How do we help you to take that less and make it more, not just for you, but because we know that you're doing this for the residents that you fight for and you serve every single day. And I think when you think about the National League of Cities, you can think of us as an organization that just doesn't shy away from those tough issues that you guys are facing because we know that you need partners in it in order for you to continue to be great leaders for your residents every single day. So when you think of NLC, I think you think of us as your thought partner, you know, as, as your fighting partner, as your resource partner to ensure that you guys are able to do that great work that you do daily. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about the work, but how and why did you get involved with the work you do for NLC? So particularly, what inspired you to do the work with NLC? And if you can tell us a little bit more about NLC Real. Absolutely. I would say the thing that drew, that drew me to NLC the most or that makes me the most inspired is, like I mentioned before, we don't shy away from tough issues. And so uh, that's the thing that inspires me the most. And when I think about NLC and I think about our real work or our work with race, equity, and leadership, um, it's the prime example of NLC being a very nimble organization. So about five years ago, uh, when the uh, Mike Brown situation happened in Ferguson, that was the time that NLC said, we know that we need to jump into this fight. And I was actually only a fellow at that time. So I hadn't, uh, wasn't fully on staff, but that was the thing that made me say I wanted to go back and work for the National League of Cities. Because any organization that wanted to boldly proclaim that they wanted to fight and help local elected officials as it relates to racial equity and not shy away from it was an organization that I wanted to be a part of. And so after I graduated, I came back to NLC and I was able to work directly, you know, with cities from across the country with Leon Andrews, who is our director, uh, who works in my center to help local elected officials to not only just understand what a racial equity means, because it's very complex and it's not as simple as people want to make it out to be. But we committed to that level of diving into making sure that we help city leaders to understand it. We then wanted to take it one step further. Now that you understand it, how do we help to train and work with you and work with your community in an effort to be able to say, we don't just understand it, now we want to do something about it. And I think the beautiful thing about our, our race equity and leadership uh, department is that we don't take one city and say this is a one size fits all. We recognize that Kankakee has its own special certain problems, just like the city that I grew up may have its certain problems and just like a city like LA. So we are able to work with cities exactly where they are, not what it, what's happening in the national media, not what's happening in other cities, but what's going on in Kankakee. And we're able to help to break down some of those complex issues and then dive right into, now that you understand racial equity and we've helped you to normalize and understand the language to use, we then move right into the phase of being able to organize. How do we help you and your city to organize to do something about those issues within your city as it relates to racial equity? And it could be a whole host of different issues because race in America is extremely complex. It started long before any of us got here, you know, which means it's going to take a while for us to make sure that we do something about it, but we know that we have to do something now. And that's exactly what we do with our race equity and leadership department. We help to train local leaders. We make sure that there's community involvement and they understand that impact. And then we also work with them to say that now that you understand it, you've organized some of these issues, how do you operationalize it? How do you do something about it? How do you find that place to start? And it was 
being able to see those types of things happening within NLC, that inspired me to say that I wanted to dedicate my life to the work and the continuing the fight of racial equity, but more specifically to do it alongside local leaders, because they talk about it at the federal level, they may mention it at the state level, but it's in local communities where things get done, where change actually happens. And that's the reason why I was inspired to continue to work at the National League of States, more specifically with our race equity and leadership department here within our organization. Okay. So as we talk about the work of NLC and you're working with municipalities across the country, what are some of the issues that you're working on right now? Me personally, uh, we're doing, we're working on a lot of different issues, uh, to be quite quite frank. But when I think about our, our work with Rio, I wanted to start in two, two areas. We're not just committed to working with cities and local government. You know, we're very much committed to making sure we're doing the work internally within our organization as well. And so one of the initiatives that I lead across our organization is called, uh, we have a racial equity working group internally. And that's where I'm taking staff from across the organization, their skill sets, their expertise, in order to make sure that they are focusing and centering racial equity. The reason why I'm starting there and uh, wanting to note the level of importance of that is because the work that our staff does directly benefits our members. So uh, the more our staff knows about racial equity, the more that they're ensuring that they're putting it a part of their research uh, uh, initiatives and projects, the more that they're making sure that it's a part of their technical assistance, all of those things help us to directly say to local elected officials, to city staffers, to mayors and council members across the organization to say that we have the best services for you that are tailored for you. So that's one of the, the things that I'm really working on, just personally within the organization of the National League of Cities. But as it relates to how we're working directly with cities across the country, uh, when it comes to race equity and leadership, we have these training programs uh, within NLC, and there are a whole host of different training programs. Um, and, and one of them is what we call our, our Real 101 series, where we're working directly with mayors and council members for um, a few days at a time, a couple of hours a day at a time. And we are just sitting there helping to dismantle all of the uh, idiosyncrasies that come with not understanding race. So we help local elected officials figure out how do we even talk about it together so that we can create that plan, you know, for our entire city, our entire municipality, and being able to use our, our residents as well. That's a really big piece of the work that we're doing internally as it relates to racial equity. Another major piece that we're doing is we're also talking about uh, what does reparations mean? you know, for, for cities, because it looks very different from across the, the country. So we're working to build a, a network that centers, you know, that type of a dialogue so that we can continue to educate people across the country on, on what, what does that mean? What can it look like? How can it benefit cities? And again, it's not a one size fits all. Another thing that we're doing is we're working really hard to lift the voices of local leaders and their communities and community organizers. So oftentimes people can maybe turn on a television screen and you may hear particular things happening in the national media. At NLC, we focus on what's real, i.e. the name of our, our department, which is real. We want to lift those voices of the folks that are on the front lines so that we can really say that these are the folks that are working in this every single day. Here are the people that you should be listening to because they're out there understanding their residents, listening to their residents, and working to put together the active plans necessary in order to be able to make systematic change because we know that systemic and institutionalized racism is very real across the country and it's in so many different places that most people don't know. And so by lifting those voices, we're giving people the opportunity that normally wouldn't have the chance to speak on this and that our leaders within the local space the chance to be able to lift their voice, you know, on a national platform. And, and in addition to that, we also work with a lot of the major foundations across the country that are specialized in a racial equity. So we're currently working with um, the, the Wells Fargo Foundation and working very strongly with what we consider our racial healing work. And so it's one thing to think about this from a system, systematic institutionalized perspective, which is very important. It's another thing to think about racial healing from the standpoint of being able to uh, being able to go directly to communities and, and to be able to help them to heal. So there are two very separate things. 
the, the institutionalized side of things, but our racial healing work with our Wells Fargo was going in and helping to create those community conversations that are very much important to the foundation of being able to push communities forward, to push cities forward, to push villages and towns forward across this country. And so those are just a few of the, the many things that we're working on here at Rio. But I think if I could sum it all up is the most important work that we do is we work directly with mayors, council members, and city staff helping them to understand what racial equity is and how they're able to dismantle systemic and institutionalized racism across the country, but more specifically within their localities. Okay. All right. Um, National League of Cities um, and the city of Kankakee have recently uh, become connected uh, since I became a mayor in 2017. And uh, many people don't understand the benefits of being a part of this membership organization. So can you speak to, I can speak to some, but can you share some of the benefits um, of, of a, for a city, smaller city like um, Kankakee? A lot of people think about the big cities like LA and Baltimore and Chicago, and we are a city of a size of about 26,000 people. So what are some of those benefits? Absolutely. And I'm glad that you said that most people think about the big cities when they think about cities. But I wish more people knew that 80% of our country is made up of small cities. So that cities with the population size of 30,000 and below. So most of our country is based off of that. And because of that, NLC makes sure that we have member benefits that cater directly to cities of those sizes. And so we also recognize the fact that with a city of that size, you may not have all of the resources that a major city does. And so you can think of NLC as that place to go to supplement some of those resources that maybe a Chicago may have, but you may not. For example, uh, I know for a fact that the city of Chicago, the city of LA, the city of New York, they all have their own personal lobbyists that they, multiple lobbies that they pay and send to fight on Capitol Hill. But we recognize not every city can afford that. So here at NLC, we do that for small cities. So you can think of the National League of Cities as your personal lobbyist that fights every single day on Capitol Hill on behalf of just Kankakee. So that means we're fighting to make sure that you get the appropriate funding for your infrastructure. Because we know, like I said before, you still got to pave your streets, still got to pick up your trash, still have to do city services and funding. You need that in order to be able to do that. So we fight every single day. COVID has hit the country extremely hard. And we know that a lot of the funds necessary for cities to continue to use are going to slowly run out. Well, you can think of NLC again as your personal lobbyists. We're fighting every single day with our Cities Are Essential campaign to make sure that you guys are getting all the necessary funding so that you can continue to go, so that mothers continue to, to make sure that their children have an opportunity to, to get their kids to school if schools are currently open, or so that mothers have the opportunity to make sure that you know they still have the proper resources if they need to take public transportation, or whatever the case may be. Like the way that we fight, we're fighting directly for Kankakee, and, and we say that. And not only are we fighting, we're making sure that we're taking your voice with us. So you being a part of the National League of Cities, Mayor, that helps us to fully understand your issues. And we're not going and just saying we're just fighting for all cities. We're saying specifically this is what we know are the specific issues that Kankakee deals with every single day. And we won't stop until we are able to help that. Another uh, great benefit of being a part of the National League of Cities as you're a small city is the fact that we have programs called Savings and Solutions. Mm -hmm. So I know for a fact, Mayor, that you and your council members and city staffers are asked to do so much more with less. And, and because we know that, we work really hard to find the right types of partnerships within our organization to make sure that you guys are getting direct benefits. For example, we have a uh, CVS uh, you, uh, excuse me, prescription discount program that is completely free for you just because Kankakee happens to be members of the National League of Cities. So that means we ship you all uh, cards, prescription discount cards that all of your residents get to use for free. And they can get anywhere between a 25 to 35 percent discount on their medication, whether it's paid for, either, paid for by their insurance or not because we know that that will be a benefit directly for Kankakee and also saves the city's money. 
we have additional savings and solutions programs. One of our pro another one of our programs is our SC Health Program, where we're working to make sure that we're getting PPE to cities across the country at a much cheaper rate than you would ever get, because we recognize that the budgets for small cities aren't as big as large cities. So we specialize in work every single day of bringing those types of partnerships within the organization to make sure that the city of Kankakee can take part of those savings and those solutions and that your residents will be able to feel the benefits. And for us, it's not about the money. For us, it's really about making sure that you have what you need, your council members have what they need, your city staffers have what they need in order to do their jobs. And then another thing that I will say will be is a great benefit for small cities is the fact that we also have our education and training programs. So we know that in order for you to continue to be a better leader, you have to keep going and keep learning as well because the world is changing so fast. So here at the National League of Cities, we offer courses. All you have to do is be a member for you, for your council members, for your city staff, how to run more effective and efficient budgets, you know, how to hold community conversations, what's ethics and governance. We're doing and creating those types of courses and resources so that you all can say that your membership with the National League of Cities not only directly benefits your profession as a mayor and a public servant, but it also directly impacts and benefits all of your residents across Kankakee. Okay. And I'd like to remind our residents that we are a part of the prescription savings program. I believe we mailed a letter out earlier this year and enclosed a card. And um, those cards are located at various places throughout the community as well. Our Kankakee County Health Department, I believe both hospitals, Riverside Medical and Amita St. Mary's. Um, and uh, again, everybody should have received a card at their residence we sent out this year. It is not an insurance card, but it is a prescription discount card. And I encourage all of you to use that. Um, one of the other programs that you did mention that we also have been um, able to bring back to the city of Kankakee is the service line warranty program. So um, as the weather, we were really fortunate today to have a beautiful day here, unseasonably warm day in Illinois. But as the, the weather changes and gets cold, we oftentimes will get calls from our residents about their water lines um, freezing or bursting or having some issue. And so a lot of residents don't realize um, that they own part of those lines. Absolutely. And so I wanted to make sure that I was able to bring that program back to the city of Kankakee. Um, it's an optional program. Every resident was notified. You received a letter with my signature on it. Um, it was vetted through our legal team and city council. And basically, you, can, um, you have the option to purchase that coverage for your underground water and sewer lines. And if you have an issue with a, a pipe bursting or um, anything like that, um, you're basically, you're, you have insurance for it. Uh, we know that, you know, a pipe bursts, you know, a, a, a cost of, you know, a couple thousand dollars can be pretty significant particularly for people um, in a town like ours. And so I wanted to make sure people have the option of having that insurance coverage. Um, they provide someone 24 hours a, a day. There's a toll-free number. And um, so I, I encourage everyone to consider looking at that program as well. These programs are listed on the City of Kankakee's website under Mayor's Initiatives. And one was the prescription discount card, and the other was the service line warranty program. So, Shante, thank you for speaking to those. Absolutely. And, Mayor, you said something I just want to, to, to uh, reiterate. You said that it was vetted by your legal team. And the reason why I think that that's really important is because all of the programs that we have at NLC, we are very conscious of, of what the word credibility means. And what we would never want to do is to put any city in jeopardy, uh, especially given this time and day and age that we're in, uh, of any type of... Um, issues as it relates to legality or, or is this legit in a sense. And so we work very hard to vet all of our partners to ensure that any benefit that they bring to us on behalf of cities, we make sure that it's on the up and up. So our legal team vets it as well. We oftentimes have mayors and council members from across the country to give us feedback even before because we are the organization that is truly for the local elected official 
for local government. And so I just wanted to say that I appreciate your legal team making sure, you know, all those things are right. And I wanted to add that we also do the exact same thing because we would never want to put you or your residents in jeopardy for anything. Thank you for that. Okay, I think it's time for us to move on to our first clip. All right, and um, Kathy, I think if you are ready to, to cue that up for that affect life chances and opportunities based on those differences. If we look carefully, we can see how our institutions and policies have assigned racial identities and reinforced racial inequality throughout the 20th century. And this is something I think that all immigrant groups experience in one way or another when they come to America, no matter what point in time it is, because they come to a country that has historically always been highly racialized. It's a country where race has its origins in uh, slavery, um, as well as in the uh, conquest of Native American Indians. So anybody coming from the outside after that point has to fit into this racialized society in some way. And it's not always clear how people are gonna fit in right away. At the start of the 20th century, as millions of immigrants arrived from all over the world, lawmakers and social scientists debated 
how all of them, including the new European arrivals, would fit into the hierarchy of races already here. They came seeking economic opportunity, freedom, and a future for their families. Of the 23 million newcomers between 1880 and 1920, the vast majority were from Eastern and Southern Europe. Immigrants often work the hardest, poorest paying, and most dangerous jobs, along with the so-called inferior races already here, Blacks, Mexicans, and Chinese. Cities with enormous slums developed as the ugly side of industrialization in terms of the aesthetic of American cities, but also ugly in terms of the, the solidifying of class differences and class tension. As all of those things became apparent, uh, the immigrant became a, the symbol for, for what America might be becoming. By 1910, 58% of American mining and factory workers were immigrants. Like Mexicans and African Americans, Italians, Slavs, and Jews were often desired as laborers, but also feared, seen as promiscuous, lazy, or stupid. Some saw it as a racial invasion. Charles Davenport, a famous biologist, expressed those fears in 1911. The population of the United States, wrote Davenport, will, on account of the great influx of blood from southeastern Europe, rapidly become darker in pigment, smaller in stature, more given to crimes of larceny, kidnapping, assault, murder, rape, and sexual immorality. And the ratio of insanity in the population will rapidly increase. And this was also a time when scientific race theory began to take off. And people began to uh, look at society and look at, at groups of people in more racialized terms. So people were perceived as, as being separate races. So you had kind of a higher order of white races were seen as the Nordics, as opposed to what many of the nativists called the lower races of Europe. There are various groups like the American Breeders Association, the Eugenics Research Association, who not only are doing research on various racial types, in this case, Hebrews, Slavs, Mediterraneans, what we would call now the Caucasian race, uh, we break it down to 35 or 37 or 45 races for study. And uh, a lot of the language was beginning to get at the idea that those differences were actually uh, rooted in, in reproduction, They're rooted in inheritable traits. They were heritable, they were biological, they were immutable. The more the newcomers were forced into low-paying jobs and diseased tenements, the more these conditions were explained as natural consequences of their innate racial character. Biology was destiny. Which side of the racial divide you found yourself on could be a matter of life or death. Between 1890 and 1920, 2,500 African Americans were lynched in the South. In 1915, Leo Frank, a Jew living in Atlanta, was pulled from jail and hanged by a mob for allegedly killing a white girl. Writing about the lynching, a black journalist wondered 
is the Jew a white man? Some historians have suggested that these new immigrant groups from Europe uh, were in between peoples. They were in a transitional stage when compared to uh, Anglo-Saxon Protestants, groups such as Italians um, or Jews, were seen as not being fully white, perhaps. But when compared to African Americans or were compared to Asians, um, their whiteness became more salient, became more visible. Could European ethnics become fully white and thus fully American? By 1910, a new term was entering popular culture to describe the transformation of Europeans. The phrase came from the title of a Broadway play by Israel Sangwill. God, said Sangwill, would melt down the races of Europe into a single pure essence, out of which he would mold Americans. So when Irish, when Germans, when Italians were coming and they didn't speak the language, they didn't know the culture, the idea was they will assimilate into American culture they will become American, which in the American tradition has meant white American. But that melting pot never included people of color. Blacks, Chinese, Puerto Ricans, etc. could not melt into the pot. They could be used as wood to produce the fire for the pot, but they could not be used as material to be melted into the pot. Whiteness was key to citizenship. In 1790, Congress had passed an act declaring that only free white immigrants could become naturalized citizens. After the Civil War, naturalization was extended to persons of African descent as well. But it was the white citizen who had clear access to the vote sat on juries, was elected to public office, and had better jobs. Whiteness was not simply a matter of skin color. To be white was to gain the full rewards of American citizenship. In order to be a naturalized citizen in this country, you had to be categorized as white or black. And almost everybody who tried to naturalize, all but I think one case that went to the Supreme Court, all of them were people trying to be categorized as white. So the court had to make decisions about who was white and who was not. Courts and legislators had long been in the business of conferring racial identities in the South to enforce Jim Crow segregation and laws against mixed marriages. Courts had to first determine who was black under law. And here's where it really gets interesting. You got some places, for example, Virginia. Virginia law defined a black person as a person with one sixteenth African ancestry. Now Florida defined a black person as a person with one eighth African ancestry. Now Alabama said you're black if you got any black ancestry, any African ancestry at all. But you know what this means? You can walk across a state line and literally, legally change race. Now, what does race mean under those circumstances? You give me the power, I can make you any race I want you to be because it is a social political construction. In 1909, American courts had that power. That year, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Massachusetts ruled that Armenians, often classified as Asiatic Turks, were legally white. If Armenians could be designated white, what of the other so-called Asiatic races? Filipinos, Syrians, the Japanese, could they also petition successfully to be designated white by the courts and thus become Americans? In 1922, when Japanese businessman Takao Ozawa petitioned the Supreme Court for naturalization, men in the Japanese community believed his was the perfect test case. 
Kawa Ozawa came from Japan, went to the University of California at Berkeley uh, for a few years, then moved to Hawaii where he had um, a family, and he applied to become a naturalized citizen in 1915. My father wrote his own brief and everything, and he was really uh, devoted. He wanted to become an American citizen, and nothing would stop him. He was determined. Japanese growers in California watched Ozawa's case closely. By 1920, a series of alien land acts prohibited many non-citizens from owning or leasing land. Without a legal designation of whiteness to make them citizens, Japanese immigrants could not have the full protection of American law, no matter how long they lived in the country. In his brief, Azawa argued that his skin was as white as any so-called Caucasian, if not whiter, but he made a much more important second argument. But a second argument was that race shouldn't matter for citizenship. What really mattered was a person's beliefs. My honesty and industriousness are well known among my Japanese and American friends. In name, Benedict Arnold was an American, but at heart he was a traitor. In name, I am not an American, but at heart, I am a true American. The articles would come out in the paper. I thought, oh, what did he do? You know, I thought only bad things came out in the paper, and I was kind of ashamed, you know, when I was a child. And it was just the way we were brought up. I didn't have any Oriental friends. My neighbors were all Caucasian. And so he was so determined to get us, well, when the time came to be American citizens. The Supreme Court ruled that Ozawa could not be a citizen. Uh, they said he was not white within the meaning of the statute and therefore not eligible to citizenship. And the court said, well, he's not white because he's not Caucasian and Caucasians are whites. He did everything right. He learned English. He had a lifestyle that was American. He went to Christian church on Sunday. He dressed as a Westerner. He brought up his children. Um, as Americans, he did everything he was supposed to do, and, and yet he's told that he can't be a citizen because he's not white. The court ruled that according to the best known science, Ozawa was not Caucasian, but of the Mongolian race. But the court would not be bound by science in policing the boundaries of whiteness. Only three months after Azawa, the court took up the case of Bagat Sin Thind, a South Asian immigrant, U.S. Army veteran, who petitioned for citizenship on the grounds that Indians were of the Aryan or Caucasian race, and therefore white. And he makes the scientific argument, um, having learned something actually from the Azawa case, that he is Caucasian. He gets scientific authority to speak on his behalf that, in fact, South Asians are included in the Caucasian race. So here the court was in a bind because they were presented with so-called scientific evidence that Indians were Caucasian. And the court solved this problem by saying that it didn't matter what science said, so-called science. They actually said white is not something that can be scientifically determined, but white is something that is subjectively understood by who they call the common person, the common man. It may be true, reasoned the court, that the blonde Scandinavian and the brown Hindu have a common ancestor in the dim reaches of antiquity. But the average man knows perfectly well that there are unmistakable and profound differences between them today. 
The same court that used science to determine whiteness in Ozawa three months before now refuted its own reasoning in Thind. Thind might well be Caucasian, the High Court said, but he was not white. The justices never said what whiteness was, only what it wasn't. Their implied logic was a circular one. Whiteness was what the common white man said it was. The court often decided who was white and who wasn't based on whether they just felt that the person would politically fit well in to the kind of society that we were trying to build. And sometimes it was pretty explicit that this is what the court was doing. There was widespread racial views that Asians were undesirable, that they threatened to contaminate uh, the American society. Basically that Asians are too different, that they can never really become like the rest of us. The consequences of the unanimous verdict in U.S. versus Thind were catastrophic for the Indian community. South Asians who had naturalized before the verdict were stripped of their citizenship and property. Vashno Das Begai was a successful merchant who fled British tyranny in India to rape his family in a free country. After his American citizenship was revoked, he took his own life. He left a suicide note for his family and another for the public. But now they come and say to me I am no longer an American citizen. What have I made of myself and my children? We cannot exercise our rights. We cannot leave this country. Humility and insults blockades this way and bridges burned behind. Japanese community, the verdicts in the Yazawa and Thin cases were equally devastating. Now, as aliens ineligible for citizenship, many growers were unable to purchase or even lease land to stay in business. Thousands of acres were seized from Japanese immigrants and sold to white farmers. By the time the racial requirement for naturalization was finally removed in 1952, Takawa Ozawa was long dead. The notion that Asians are racially unassimilable and that they're ineligible to citizenship uh, because of their race is something that I think has had uh, a real enduring uh, effect. The fact that they were seen as non-American enabled many Americans to see them as uh, as the enemy and to strip them totally of their civil liberties and to put them in, in internment camps during World War II. The legacy of this idea is that um, even those who are third or fourth generation Asian Americans are still perceived as foreigners. In 1924, Congress passed the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, which effectively banned Asian immigration until 1965. Johnson-Reed also cut immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe to a trickle. Your blood's the same as mine, mine's the same as his. Do you know what this wonderful country is made of? It's made up World War II found the U.S. at war with Nazi Germany and Japan. Films like the 1945 Oscar-winning short, The House I Live In, call for national unity and ethnic tolerance. What is America to me? A name. And these other uh, distinctions which had carried so much power in an earlier period, the Celts love. Anglo-Saxon, 
um, started to fade away. There was, they had no purchase because those distinctions didn't seem to hold the key to any social questions that were worth answering anymore. The more important and more pressing political social questions seemed to hinge on, on uh, black and white. All races and religions Sinatra's song was one of tolerance, but the line that sang of my neighbor is black and white was cut from the film. Come on, man. Bye. 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 European immigrants were learning that whiteness was more than skin color. It was the privilege of opportunity, and above all, exclusive. There's this whole very standard narrative of the European mobility model. We came here with nothing. We worked hard. We, we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. And it's offered up as proof of the openness of the American economic order. Left out of the bootstrap myth of European ethnics was access to opportunities close to non-whites. Roosevelt's New Deal reforms offered many Americans a path out of poverty. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 50 millions of our citizens. But the original social security program excluded farm workers and domestics, most of whom were not white. And many unions locked blacks and Mexicans into low-paying jobs or kept them out altogether. But perhaps the best example of how European ethnics would finally gain the full benefits of whiteness came with an innovation in housing at the end of World War II. Leon has joined us. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Mayor. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you this evening? Doing well as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and get into it. We just want you to share a little bit about yourself so our community here in Kankakee knows who you are and what you do. Sure. Hello, Kankakee. It's great to be with you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for inviting us and for your leadership. Um, I am Leon Andrews. I uh, lead our race equity and leadership department here um, at the National League of Cities. Um, Rio uh, was created uh, six years ago after the killing of Michael Brown um, uh, in the city of Ferguson. Um, Ferguson was a member of the National League of Cities. They reached out to us uh, six years ago as they were dealing with the racial tension and we're trying to figure out how to respond um, and NLC was not necessarily in a position to really respond to the racial tension. Um, we weren't doing a lot of racial equity work, uh, but on, we've been on that journey since. Uh, we obviously said at that time, don't do what you're doing, tanks on the streets, not the best way to respond. Uh, but we've been on the journey to really not just help the city, the city of Ferguson, but how do we help other cities that are either trying to be proactive or reactive as they are dealing with racial tension. And so we've created real six years ago. We've been on that journey um, to try to figure out how to help cities to be, uh, and local leaders understand the role you play to eliminate racial disparities. As we see that in your cities, how do you heal racial tensions and build more equitable communities? Uh, and so that's really driving the work we do, the trainings and the technical assistance work that we do with a lot of cities across the country. Okay. Let's talk about systemic racism. We hear that term a lot, and I think some people want to gain a better understanding of what that actually means. So what are your thoughts that you would like to share on that? Yeah, thank you for that question, Mayor. Um, and I really appreciate you creating this space for the community to really sit with this video. Um, if there was a lot to take in, I just want to acknowledge that the first part of the video, for those that are listening in, um, and watching this, that there's a lot to sit with in the first part, and we're gonna share the, the, the second part shortly. Um, but as we talk about racism and systemic racism, you know, it's really understanding how we as a country have understand and process race. 
Um, and, and, and particularly as we show the second part of the video, when we talk about systemic racism, um, it's really important to sit with the first part of this video, which is as we think about how race was defined in this country, we've struggled to really understand what race really means, right? Uh, this first part of the video was really sitting with understanding even how our courts systems, the Supreme Court, was struggling to define, well, what is race, right? And as you saw in the examples in the video, they struggled with that um, in terms of defining what white was. And, uh, and so as you saw the different cases that came before the court, um, it, was, it was difficult for them to be able to say, well, what, what, what is white? Is it Caucasian uh, from a science perspective? And the courts then say, well, maybe it's not. And, and so they end up saying, well, that's what the common white person would say white is. Um, and so we've struggled with white because white was in our history, and this might be very difficult for people who are hearing this for the first time, you know, white was, is a social, race was a construct that was created. And, and, and as we created that social political construct, it actually created access for people who were defined as white of what it meant to be a citizen. Citizen gave you access. And as you saw with the, the examples of those who wanted to become white because it would make them have access, we realized that we have struggled with this whole political and social construct of defining race. Um, and so just understanding that is a really important part of getting to understanding what institutional and systemic structural racism is. I want to hold, Mayor, if you're okay with it, I want to hold off on actually defining institutional and structural racism after we look at the second part of the video. Okay. Because the second part of the video, I think, will bring to light how we start to understand that. So I want to, I want to, I'm actually really curious, really, uh, with your audience. I know you have folks on Facebook Live and others. Um, I'm, I'm curious where your audience is. Uh, I'm not on Facebook, but I, uh, right now as we're talking to each other, but I'm curious how folks are sitting with this and you know, if, if, um, and if it's possible to ask the folks that are watching on Facebook Live right now to you know, just to think about one word that they are processing right now, the first 20 minutes of this video. And if, if they can put it into that chat, the chat on the comments on Facebook Live, I'm kind of curious where the audience, where your, uh, where your, uh, where the citizens of, of of Kankakee are right now, if they're uh, if they're sitting with this, and it'd be great to kind of just kind of, just kind of um, capture that. Like, how are folks sitting with this? Where, what, if you have one word that you would want to use to kind of capture your feeling right now as you're sitting with the first part of this video, I would love for you to put that into the uh, Facebook Live, you know, if there's other platforms that you're using right now, and for us to just hear that, to hear where people are um, in the city as they're sitting with this and to see if that gives us a little bit of context of, um, um, you know, the first part of the video at least, how people are sitting with this. Okay. So Leon is specifically asking all of our viewers, um, after you've watched the first part of the video, to give one word of how you feel right now. How you know what's what thought has that video left you with? If you can comment, if you're on Facebook. I know some of my city council members are watching and you all are leaders of the community, so I'm gonna call on you guys to share. And there's no wrong answers, of course. This is all, this is all just for us to learn together and understand one another's experiences. I'm going to be a good example and start. 
Um, we're asking for a reaction to the video, the first part of the video with one word. And I would say, I will admit that this is, I saw the video once before, but the first time I saw it and even now seeing it tonight, um, I think I would say shocking. Mm. And I was shocked because uh, just, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, focused on policy work and how, how public policy shapes our lives and to hear that our court system, you know, defined people by whiteness, which means they had certain privileges in this country as citizens and certain access as a result of that whiteness. Um, that was really shocking for me. So my word would be shocking. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, and, 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 and part of me, I think, too, is important. I appreciate you sharing that word, Mayor. And, you know, I think it's important to just acknowledge that um, if any of us were being challenged to ask, how do we define what white is? How would we define what white is? Even today in 2020, right? At the end of the 2020, like how do each of us define what it, what is white? Like each of us have learned what it, what white is and what black is and what Latin, Hispanic, and Asian is, but but how would we define it? I have right? a couple people, Leon. Um, one yeah. one said insightful. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, two people. Um, one person said deep. <laughs> Um, another person says access comes to mind or lack of access. Mm -hmm. Right. That's great. And um, thank, thank you for uh, sharing your, uh, how you're processing this. And again, there's a second part of this that we will share very shortly um, to also process. And, you know, and, and again, I, I, I think it's really important to um, to be able to sit with all of this and think what what does this mean as you're sitting with it and realizing this is not a judgment on anyone, right? This is not attending to say the Supreme Court should have known how to define white or like this is not intended to do that. Because if you think, of, uh, if we think about ourselves, I want everyone to pause for a moment, even if, if there were one word coming in, the other word, the other thought that comes to me is um, this is, again, to those that are listening, I'm curious, how would you define, I have two questions. How would you define what it means to be white and what it means to be black? Like, do you have a definition? Because I'm not judging the Supreme Court during this documentary. Like, if anyone was asking you to define what it means to be white and what it means to be black, what would be your definition? They asked the Supreme Court to come up with that. Do you have a definition that you have? And this is a challenging one. And I'm, 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 and so you, this might, you may not, I'm curious how many will, will, will respond. I don't have a good one. I'm going to be honest with that. I don't have a good answer. How, I, how have I learned about race? Mm -hmm. I, all of us have learned about race in this country. And so I've processed it. I know I have, and each of us have about what it means, how I think about what white is and what black is and what Latin and Hispanic is and Asian, but how do you define it? Because the courts tried to do science and said if you're Caucasian, you are white, right? And then the case came before the court and said, well, I'm Caucasian, am I white? And the court's like, no, you're not white. Because, you know, it didn't meet the standard for them. So Caucasian, most of, in my life, all my life, I used to say white Caucasian, white Caucasian. But the court says like, no, you just can't follow the line of Caucasian because not every Caucasian is white. So it's like, okay, it's like now you just messed me up. I don't even know how to define what white is. <clears throat> and then defining black, you saw how they tried to define by state. So one state said if you had one eighth African ancestry, another state if you had one sixteenth African ancestry, another state if you had any ancestry there was African. So you literally you could cross the state line and be, and be not black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have struggled in this country to define what it meant to be white and the differences in how we define what it meant to be black. 
So my question, you know, to the to those that are listening in, is well, how do you define it? I would love to hear thoughts from the community about how you define it. What does it What does it mean to you? And as they're doing that, <clears throat> we did have a couple more words come in: educational, informative, overwhelming. Mm. So Leon is asking the community now, we want this to be a conversation, just so you all know. We don't want to just show a film and, and have the NLC team talk, but we really want to engage in a conversation. So he's going to be asking questions throughout this presentation. So right now he's asking, how do you define being white and how do you define being black? And it's not an easy question. I want to acknowledge that. It's a, and I don't have an easy answer for you either. So I'm not suggesting by any means that there is an easy answer to either one of those questions. Someone said, it's an interesting question. I've thought of what it means to be black, but I've never thought of what it means to be white. Mm. I think whiteness means never having to prove you're white. Mm. Good perspective, Inter interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought Caucasian was white. Mm. That's where I was at too. And again, no right or wrong answers, we're just sharing right. our experiences. That's right. Anybody else? <laughs> no, that's great. I appreciate again. I, I again, I really appreciate folks sharing and how important that is to be able to do that. Because um, that's we we all to be able to do this work and you know just acknowledging how do we get get to a space where we're comfortable talking about race? Because we have not been we've been taught not to talk about race, mm -hmm. right? It's like and and that space is part of the problem. Right, because if you understand how the brain works, and I want to make sure I'm very clear, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I do know from the research of neuroscientists that we know that how our brains work, 5% um, of our brains, are we are consciously aware of what we're thinking. 5%, 95%, we are unconsciously aware of what we're thinking. And I can prove it if I have an opportunity to do that to you. I would happily do it. We have a lot of tests that does that. But if we know that our brains think most of the things that we think about happen in our unconscious, that has also played out in how we've thought about race. Leon, we did have some more come in. Oh, That's, yes, please. Thank you, community members. Um, someone said last in a total poll, so I'm assuming that they're defining black. Establishment versus persecuted black. I thought black was of African descent of color, upper class versus lower class. So that's some additional input from the community. Yeah. Privileged. Mis misunderstood. And, and, and I want to acknowledge that a lot of those are trying to, to get to descriptive words. Right, as they are trying to acknowledge what black versus white is. Um, but then those words I just acknowledged don't describe how we individually, when you look at someone, say this person is white versus black. So I want to push back a little bit. While I love those descriptions as descriptive words, each of us to a person look because we've been, we've been however we were taught this to a person, you look and say, oh, that person's white. Oh, that person's black. Oh, that person is, oh, I'm not sure what they are. Are they black? Are they white? Like all of us to a person have been taught this and whether we say it consciously or unconsciously, our brains go there. And, and so the question is, what is the brain doing that is saying like, oh, I'm making those assumptions. Is it skin color? Mm -hmm. Is it hair? Is it hair texture? Mm -hmm. Is it voice? Is it something else? All of us, to a person, we do it. And 
And so it's important to sit with that as we have created this social construct. And this first part of the video is really intended to just acknowledge that we've all struggled in the courts the highest court in our land struggled with this, but each of us struggle with this still too. And, and it's important to name that as we are talking about how we sit with race and how we have struggled in that space to define it, what race is. Couple more things. I've never thought of the definition of being white or black. That is such an interesting view. Somebody says so much to unpack with this. I also think white is privileged. I think what you were mentioning, Leon, for me, you know, hair, um, hair texture, uh, pigmentation and skin, eye shape are some of the things um, that we've been taught to look at that, that informs what we view as race. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and to be very, very, again, in this space of speaking with uh, our, your Kankakee um, uh, citizens and, and members of the community, you know, it's just like, look, it's, you know, um, there is no science to this, right? As we talk about this, you know, it's just the acknowledgement that when we look at each other, the first thing we see are the physical things. Right? And that's just bias in general. Bias is just how we make associations, whether you're bald like me or have hair, whether you have glasses or don't have glasses, whether you're tall or short, right? I mean, whether you're a man or a woman. I mean, there's a lot of things we make, assumptions we make all the time. And we do the same thing as we look at you and how we look at each other and you're making assumptions about people. And, and so do you have darker skin or lighter skin? Right, and I want to acknowledge that, and I want to acknowledge in this same space when people say you have black skin and white skin, there's a section for you to say like, wait a second, who has black skin? Who has white skin? You know, I don't have black skin, but I'm black. I I haven't met anyone that has white skin, but there's white, and so how you understand that as you process that. Right, because if you look at my skin, is my skin black or brown? Mm -hmm. Leon, a couple more comments came in. Someone said, a person with dark features and coarse, I believe they had coarse hair. I think black is associated with darkness, struggle, less than. Yeah, great, great comment. You know, it's a great comment. And I would love to, love to see that folks are processing this. Right as you're sitting with it, and it, it, and this goal is not for you to get to a space where there's an answer. It's a journey, right? And as you're creating this space for normalizing a conversation, my hope is that we get to a space as a community to normalize. How do we talk about this? What is it? What? How do we create the space where we, we can talk about it? And love the, the comments that are coming in that allows folks to be able to figure out a way to talk about it. Someone else just added that we have learned to describe by skin color, and it doesn't make people better than anyone. Those are learned behaviors. Absolutely, that's exactly right. And not just learned behaviors, it's been reinforced, right, by how we have built policy around it. And that's the second part of the video. We wanna make sure you acknowledge it. it's not just learned behavior, we have reinforced it, unfortunately, by policies, practices, and procedures that we've built in that have benefited white people over our black community, our indigenous community, our Latin community, our Hispanic community, our people of color. And so it's not just, it's not just um, you know, learned behavior. We have reinforced it, unfortunately, um, in our policies, right? And that's the other space that we'll show in as we show the second part of the video. And I feel like we're in a space to kind of transition into that, but if there's not any other comments, I have Mayor, to. I have to. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Superior versus inferior. We oh, another one. We've also been historically taught that anything dark or black is bad, and white is somehow pure. And I saw another one come in. Everything is structurally set up only for white. We have one month for Black History Month, but American history is Black history. Mm -hmm. Great comments. Yeah, great comments. Um, 
Yeah, appreciate both of the, uh, those comments that are coming, uh, all of the comments that are coming in. That's great. Okay. Um, so I think it'd be great, uh, Mayor, if we want to transition okay. because I feel like what we've done is we've laid the foundation for trying to think about race, you know, how we struggle with defining race. But the, this second part of the video, um, as we start to cue it up, is much more about how we think about the impacts of race. Particularly as we, you know, the first part of the video started to show how we struggled to find, define what white was versus black. And as we understood what it means to be white, white helped you become a citizen. And that's what this first part of the video showed. But the second part of the video shows much more than that. It shows like, what does it mean to have access, right? And as we think about policy. So we're gonna play this second part and then we'll come back and provide more context to that. It was a time when hundreds of thousands of GIs came home ready to start families, but had no place to live. The living space was at a premium. When in the Bronx they tried building Quonset huts and they turned into to slums. All the Quonset huts had uh, just uh, disintegrated. There were two families sharing a hut. One family at one end, one family at the other, and before you know it, they were, they were did awful. FHA came to the rescue by ensuring long-term, low-monthly payment mortgage loans. Veterans needed homes for families. They turned to a revolutionary New Deal housing program. It would racialize housing, wealth, and opportunity for decades in ways few could have imagined. In the 1930s, the federal government created the Federal Housing Administration, whose job it was to uh, provide loans or the backing for loans to average Americans so they could purchase a home. Due to the simulation of the National Housing Act, from every section of the country come reports of vast vision. In order to purchase a house in America prior to 1930s, you had to pay 50% of the sales price up front. The new terms of purchasing a home was that you put 10% or 20% down and the bank financed 80% of it, not over five years, but over 30 years at relatively uh, low rates. This opened up the opportunities for Americans to own homes like ever before. The average person could own that home. If these terms sound familiar, they should, because this is essentially the same financing scheme that allows most Americans to own their homes today. Federal programs and banks sank millions into the home construction industry. Their message to veterans, you can afford a new home, buy a new home now. the outskirts of Baltimore, Memphis, Chicago, Los Angeles, Denver, and other cities. Brand new communities sprang up. One of the most famous was a Long Island potato field, transformed into 17,000 new homes. It was called Levitt Town. Tax dollars helped make the single-family home a mass-produced consumer item. The American dream had a new name, suburbia. You have to remember the people who came here in 1947, 1948, were young ex-GIs whose uppermost concern was taking advantage of the GI Bill and making things better for themselves. Before moving to Levittown, Herb Callisman and his wife Doris lived in a cramped attic apartment in New York City. And when we began to look for an apartment, we found that the apartments were 100, 125, 150 dollars a month. I know that's unbelievable today, but it was too expensive for us. And out here in Levittown, the mortgage payments were 65 dollars a month. Every eye. A brand new sinker built in oven, a new refrigerator. 
refrigerator and the fire. If you were buying a leather home in 1947, 48, 49, 50, and 51, you would get, this would be your kitchen. You would get a GE stove, a GE refrigerator, and a Bendix wash machine. It would be part of the real estate. We came to Levittown and we found the model house. And we walked in and we looked around. And uh, of course, in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto, so to speak. It was an interesting experience, an interesting lifestyle. Seeing all the new modern conveniences, very fascinating. Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. It was as though it wasn't real. You can't imagine. But for someone to come out and actually tell you that they can't sell to you. You know, I, I was really on a, oh, man, look at this house. Can you imagine having this? And then for them to tell me because of the color of my skin, I can't be a part of it. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. <laughs> Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized a national appraisal system where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk so that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America, and it suburbanized it racially. The racial logic adopts the principle that an integrated neighborhood is a bad risk, is a financial risk, that an integrated neighborhood is likely to be an unstable neighborhood, uh, unstable socially, but therefore also unstable economically. When the white residents of 8 Mile Road in Detroit were told they were too close to a black neighborhood to qualify for a positive FHA rating, they built a six-foot wall between themselves and their black neighbors. Once the wall went up, mortgages on the white properties were approved. Between 1934 and 1962, the federal government underwrote $120 billion in new housing. Less than 2% went to non-whites. I can understand an individual, depending on his environment or his family or whatever, uh, being racist, but for your country to um, sanction it, give him tools to do that. There's something deadly wrong there. I think we have
had the golden chance after World War II, and we, and we flubbed it because uh, it, here, here we had a GI Bill that was uh, most, you know, that was available to everybody, uh, but in a way they didn't make it available to everybody, and, uh, and that was a golden opportunity in this country, and we missed it. We really missed it. You can always tell, can't you? A town with good real estate people is a more substantial community because more people own their own homes. That's right. And now it's hard to believe that the federal government nationalized and introduced redlining. In a funny way, it wasn't just giving something to whites. It was constructing whiteness. Whiteness meant... As, as in the past, whites have met being a citizen and being a Christian. It now meant living in the suburbs. Only 50 years before, European ethnics were believed to be distinct races. Now, in these new segregated neighborhoods, they blended together as white Americans. We did have different religious groups. We were mixed up there, but uh, we, we were an all-white community, and I think it's an unrealistic world. I think there's something sterile about everyone being on the same economic level and everyone being the same color. It certainly doesn't um, promote um, a feeling of a wider world, wider, not whiter, um, to live in a place where there are only people that look like you. Cartoonist Bill Griffin remembers moving from Brooklyn to Levittown as a kid. It's an untenable artificial world. You're creating a weird utopia in a way. A, a utopia of, of you know, middle-class white people who were trying to deny that they were living in a multi-racial world. And how long can you keep that up? You can keep that up forever. Whether there were going to be black people in Levittown, it, it would be almost the equivalent of saying, are there going to be Martians in Levittown? The basic idea of whiteness is who's included who's part of the family, and it has material consequences. Blacks were completely left out of the housing market. The housing market they were exposed to was largely public housing. And pu public housing, first of all, was built almost exclusively with, with some, uh, with a few exceptions, in the central city. And after World War II, we started building this larger and larger public housing projects, which are called vertical ghettos. All of a sudden, you're concentrating large numbers of poor people of color in one place. Another federal program, Urban Renewal, was supposed to make cities more livable. 90% of all housing destroyed by urban renewal was not replaced. Two-thirds of those displaced were black or Latino. Fair housing for all, all human beings who live in this country is now a part of the American way of life. In 1968, President Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act. For the first time, racial language was removed from federal housing policy. Non-white families began moving into traditionally white communities in numbers. We lived in an apartment, a two-family uh, two house in Queens, and when we came here, it was the first time we bought a house. And I was looking for everything in the storybooks. The Frisbees moved from Queens to suburban Roosevelt, only a few miles from Levittown. Like the Frisbees, many non-white families would discover the economic value of race in the real estate market. 
they watched as their homes and neighborhoods in suburbia declined precisely because they had moved into them. When I moved into a neighborhood, I thought it would stay intact the way it was. On the street that I moved on when I moved there, it was predominantly white. Within two years, it was predominantly black. It was called blockbusting. Real estate agents preyed on the racial fears of white homeowners to get them to sell their homes quickly for less than market value. The homes were resold to non-whites at inflated prices. Well, they would say, you know, we're having black people move in. Now, I will give you cash if you want to sell me your house. Do you want to stay with black people next door to you? And that's the way it went on. And uh, as Bunny said, a lot of the people just said, yes, I'll take the money and run. And uh, that's the start of the white people leaving. As more black and Latino families moved to Roosevelt, real estate became more and more depressed, just as the FHA had predicted. But why? I have an idea my house is probably worth around 120 in this town. Or what it would be worth in one tour or Garden City or some other place. Probably around 200,000 or better. Now, now you're talking about 80,000. You, uh, you said to me one time about why do people dislike the blacks? Well, money-wise, there's a reason. Not that you dislike the blacks so much, but you dislike what happens when a community turns from white to black. It wasn't African Americans moving in that caused housing values to go down in Roosevelt and other neighborhoods. It was whites leaving. When a neighborhood, a previously white neighborhood, starts to integrate, even if individual whites don't have personal or psychological animosity or racial hatred, they still have an economic incentive to leave because they recognize that others would make the same calculation and leave first. So you get a vicious circle where whites calculate that otherwise you're going to sell when a neighborhood integrates, therefore they want to sell first to avoid losses, and, and they actually make it happen. They make white flight happen. And if you think about African Americans, if African Americans are 20% of that market, it means that 80% of the people are not looking in those places for homes. So the prices of those homes declines or stays stable. And banks contribute to this by continually making loans in regions that are uh, on the rise, white communities, and making it difficult to get loans in black communities. So there's a difference, there's a lack of symmetry that's important to keep, keep in mind. That, that uh, So it's not the same when, when whites are all by themselves, because when they're all by themselves, they're taking all the resources with them. They're taking all the amenities with them. But when blacks are by themselves, they can't get, they can't get loans, uh, they don't have a decent tax base, there are no jobs. And then that, that becomes associated with black space. In the end, what happened to Roosevelt happens in many neighborhoods when white families and businesses flee. The tax base eroded. Schools and services declined. The town was seen by county officials as a legitimate dumping ground for welfare families. At one point, we had explicit laws that says whites are on top and blacks are on the bottom. Today, we have many of the same practices without the explicit language. And those practices are largely inscribed in geography. Uh, and so geography does some the work of Jim Crow laws. So many people are confused as to why after 50 years of civil rights are our schools still segregated? 
why are housing markets still segregated? Why are jobs still segregated? Uh, and again, a lot of this is a function of how we've reinscribed the racial geographic space in the United States. That structure is still what we're living with today. As homes in white communities appreciated value, the net worth of these white families grew. For most non-white families who stayed in urban neighborhoods, the housing market open to them in the 50s and 60s was largely a rental market. You don't gain equity by paying rent. Where one's family lives in America is not just a matter of, of taste and preference. You have the issue of housing and wealth. The majority of Americans hold most of their wealth in the form of home equity. So that's their nest egg. That's how they can finance the education of their offspring. That's how they can um, sort of save up for retirement. Um, it's their savings bank, right? They're living in their savings bank. My family, like a lot of families, was in Detroit struggling to buy a house. You had a dual housing market, one white, one black. A housing market with one with a lot of demand, another housing market with very little demand. My father lives in the house that I grew up in. The house today, five bedroom house, is worth about $20,000. The same house bought in the suburbs would be worth today about $320,000. So whites moving to the suburb were being subsidized in the accumulation of wealth, while blacks were being divested and these were public policy decisions in which, on one hand, people were given access to property, um, given title, and subsequently wealth. And on another hand, where people were not given access to property, did not generate wealth, and did not generate the kind of opportunity for the next generation. So if you can get a government loan and with your GI Bill, your newly earned college degree, and buy a house in an all-white area that then appreciates in value, that then you can pass on to your children, then you're passing on wealth, that has all been made more available to you as a consequence of racist policies and practices. To this child of that parent, it looks like my father worked hard, bought a house, passed his wealth on to me, made it possible for me to go to school, mortgage that house so I could have, you know, a relatively debt-free college experience and finance my college education. How come your father didn't do that? You know, well, there's some good reasons why maybe your father had a harder time doing it if you're African-American or Latino or Native American. And the thing is really, uh, slick about whiteness, if you will, is that most of the benefits can be obtained without ever doing anything personally. The whites, they're getting the spoils of the racist system, even if they're not personally racist. To glimpse one of the far-reaching consequences of racial inequality, you need only consider one statistic, comparative net worth or wealth. If you add up everything you own and subtract all your debts, what's left is your net worth. Today, the average black family has only one eighth the net worth or assets of the average white family. That difference has seemingly grown since the 1960s, since the civil rights triumphs, and is not explained by other factors like education, earnings rates, savings rates, it is really the legacy of racial inequality from generations past. No other measure captures the legacy, the sort of cumulative disadvantage of race, or cumulative advantage of race for whites than net worth or wealth. Even with the same income, white families have on average twice the wealth of black families. Much of that difference lies in the value of their homes. But what happens when we compare families along the color line who have similar wealth? When you make the right comparison, when you compare a black kid from a family with the same income and wealth level as the white kid um, from 
the similar economic situation, rates of college graduation are the same. Rates of employment and work hours are the same. Rates of welfare usage are the same. So when we're talking about race in terms of a cultural account, of these differences or a genetic accounting of these differences, we're really missing the picture because we're making the wrong comparison. We want to be a colorblind society that values the content of character over the color of skin. The hope of thousands of newcomers who arrive each year is that we already are. I don't see color. I see people. The saying goes. There are people from a hundred other nations who look different from you. People whose religion, history, skin color, and reason for being here today may be different from yours. But in post civil rights America, is color blindness the same as equality? The notion of color blindness came to us from that famous I Have a Dream speech of Dr. Martin Luther King, where he said that people should be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of the skin. And what has happened in the post civil rights era is that whites have assumed that we are already there, that we're in a society where color does not matter. On the one hand, the civil rights era officially ended inequality of opportunity, officially ended de jure legal inequality. At the same time, those civil rights triumphs did nothing to address the underlying economic and social inequalities that had already been in place. It doesn't recognize the fact that the rewards, the house, the Lexus, the you know the big bank account, those are not only the rewards of the you know the pot of gold at the end of the game, they're also the starting position for the next generation. The wealth gap grows. The advantages of being white accumulate from one generation to the next. What are the benefits or the advantages to being white in a society that has historically given benefits and advantages to members of the dominant group? And if you are a person who has that privilege, you don't necessarily notice it. So until we recognize that there's really no way to talk about equality of opportunity without talking about equality of condition, then we're stuck with this paradoxical idea of a colorblind society in a society that's totally unequal by color. Claiming we don't see race won't end racial inequality. As Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman said, to get beyond racism, we must first take account of race. There is no other way. And just as we're born into the system, we don't ask to be loaded up with stereotypes or omissions or distortions when we come into the world. We don't ask to be in a, a structure which is unfair. But that's what we have inherited. Whether you identify as a person of color, whether you identify as a white person, it doesn't matter. I think we have to be uncomfortable with the preservation arrangement. Uh, in a sense, I think we have to be willing to be uncomfortable, willing to demand more of ourselves and more of our country, and willing to make the invisible visible. I think we all have to think about what can I influence? I don't influence everything, but the things I do influence, I can think about how am I making this a more equitable environment? I can ask myself, who's included in this picture and who isn't? Who's had opportunities in my environment and who hasn't? What can I do about that? Mm. 
Leon, we did have a couple comments come in. Sure. Okay. Someone said that the thing that gets me is when people say we use the race card. How can that be determined when you do not know the feeling? Racism is a feeling you get after an injustice has occurred. Someone else said, yes, you don't think about it until it affects you personally. Jane, um, someone else said, there are many homes in our city of Kankakee that no one can still find the language in the deeds with covenants that disallowed the home being sold to blacks. Someone else said, black is unhealed, white control. Black is uh, unhealed. Unhealed, white Un control. Unhealed, un U-N-H-E-A-L-E-D, unhealed. Unhealed. Black is unhealed. Black, okay. unhealed, white. I think they're trying to say they have black slash unhealed, white slash control. Hmm. I would, I would love that person, if they're listening, to maybe explain a little bit more for me what that unhealed means, um, just so I understand that. But uh, I'm trying to process. There's a lot. I don't know if you do one at a time, but let me just first just acknowledge there's a lot to take in with that video um, and the documentary. And um, in the space of self-care, I do want folks to um, that are listening in to take some deep breaths. Uh, while I can't see you, um, I do want to do it with you. Take a deep breath in and let it out. If you are listening to me just for your own self-care, take another deep breath in and let it out. And I just want to acknowledge that we, we show this video not for a space of people feeling attacked or people, I, we know it serves as some triggers, um, but want you to be able to sit with this for a moment and try to understand there's a lot of content in this space. And so the mayor asked me earlier in the last segment of how we define systemic racism and what does that look like? And the reason why I told the mayor I wanted to hold off in trying to be able to define it is because I wanted you to be able to sit with that a little bit as we talk about what systemic racism is. Um, and so it, it, it's in that space that I want to, um, you know, at least um, name the language that I think is important to be able to share. So I wanted, for those that are seeing, the, seeing this, wanting to be able to talk about what we mean when we talk about racism, right? And so there are different levels of racism that we want you to be able to sit with. Um, there's individual racism, right? Which is individual behaviors and acts, um, bias and judgment, discrimination by individual based upon race. But the video really started to talk much more beyond that. Uh, it, it named institutional racism, which is like there have been policies practices and procedures that have worked better for white people than our people of color, whether we're talking about our black people, our Hispanic, our Latin community, our indigenous community, our Asian Pacific Islander community. And we know that that has worked in that institutional racism talks about one institution. We know that that has existed in one institution. And we know historically it happened intentionally and, and advertently, but we know now it has happening now more unintentionally and inadvertently. And so when we talk about institutional racism, we're acknowledging it's happened in one institution. Structural racism, and I think the video really showed, showed a light on this, it didn't just happen in one institution, it has happened in all of our institutions. The word all is important. We have designed government systems that have benefited white people over our people of color, historically. That we know that that is part of how we understand what structural racism is. And so then when you hear systemic racism, systemic racism is just these cogs over here, is acknowledging these things are all connected to one another. So when we talk about individual behaviors and acts, institutional in one institution and structural, they're all connected. It's a power, it's a, an oppression, it's, 
It's, it's how it's been created. And it's not a charge against one person. Racism is not intended to be a word that's supposed to be pejorative. It's not intended to be an insult. Most of the time, people hear racism as an insult versus hearing racism as a descriptive word, right? How do we understand the systems that we've cre created? And that's the space that is really important to be able to sit with. And so while I'm not able to give the full history of Kankakee, I do think it's important to sit with how do you begin to understand your history, right? And here's the population in Kankakee, right? As we think about in the last 20 years, you know, looking at your population, the, the purple being your know, the larger percentage of white versus your black um, versus your, um, your Hispanic or Latin community versus your Asian community and others, understanding that there's, there hasn't been redlining in, um, in Kankakee, but there has been redlining in, your, in, in cities across Illinois. Right, and so if you look at Chicago, this is the redlining map of the 1930s. Right, you can see where the redlining areas were in Chicago. Right, you see that area. And then what we tried to do is to show 80 years later, these same areas are exactly the way they were designed 80 years ago. These same racist policies, if you look at Chicago, you can start to see that. This is predominantly black area. This is the same redlining area in Chicago, in Illinois. It's the same if, as you look in Springfield, Illinois, right? In Springfield, there's a larger narrative. Another city that had redlining maps, while Kankakee didn't have the redlining maps, uh, you can see such a large part of Springfield, Illinois that were redlined, right? And then you can see again, areas that still remained uh, that way in in Springfield, Illinois, right? Just wanted to bring in some of those redlining maps. But what is Kankakee's story, right? This is Kankakee's maps, right? As we look at the areas that are predominantly white in Kankakee, this might look more familiar to you, right? And the areas that are predominantly black in Kankakee. Like, what's the story in Kankakee as we talk about that this is not just talking about 80 years ago, in looking at your Hispanic population, why is it that your Hispanic population or your Asian population are in that space, right? And just wanting you to be able to sit with that, um, and then this other look at your mixed race and others. Like, what's the narrative for Kankakee as you're sitting with this and engaging in, in, in really fully understanding that history? So I wanted to name a lot of that as you're really sitting with the history, we want to make sure you're not seeing this just as, oh, this just happened 80 years ago, but how do we fully understand this in the context of the story of Kankakee as we understand race in your city? So I wanted to name a lot of that as you're sitting with this. We had a couple comments coming in. The person who said black and unhealed meant that unhealed from generational trauma passed down. Look at here. The trauma that has been passed down? Yeah, through generations, between generations. Got it, got it. No, thank you for that. And acknowledging kind of the history of it. Thank you for sharing that. Thank so, you for that. Someone else said, one can see the historical racism in Kankakee by the neighborhoods. It's amazing that this is 2020 and this devaluation of property is still operating. When a city neighborhood is cleaned up, it's called gentrification. Wow. Somebody else said they agreed, and then someone says, so how do two white police officers sue the city saying it was racism? Yeah, it's a, uh, so a lot of good questions there. Um, it might be helpful to process these questions at a time <laughs> because there's a lot coming in, and, and I think we wanna be able to give each its appropriate due. Um, so I'm picking up on the last one how um, um, someone can look and say that this is racism if you're a white cop and looking at, I don't know the full story, so I feel like I'm missing context. So I'm not in the best position to give a specific response to that. But I do want to acknowledge again what racism is in the space of a definition, right? Um, and, and what we're sharing from the videos, right? As we talk about racism, you know, and particularly we talk about institutional racism, it's acknowledging that there are policies, practices, and procedures that have benefited white people 
over our black community, our Latin community, our Hispanic community, our indigenous community, and people of color. And it didn't just happen in one institution, it's happened in all of our institutions. So when we talk about racism, racism is different from discrimination, from prejudice, from bias, and this is obviously not the training to be able to talk about all of those, but when we sit with racism, we're understanding the ism of racism is connected to race and power and privilege, and, and, and that's the important space to be able to sit with. It doesn't mean that we don't have other issues to deal with, right? And it doesn't, and it also it's not intended to really attack a person. And I wanna be very clear, racism, when we talk about racism, is a system. It's not, when I say pejorative, it's not intended to be an insult. It's acknowledging that we have created a, a set of systems in our country um, that um, has had these impacts, right, in our communities. And so if we're committed to doing this work, there's this term that is called anti-racism. And, and, it, um, and a, a colleague that we've worked with, Dr. Ibram Kendi, you know, who has really spent a lot of time how to be an anti-racist. Uh, and that's very different to say that I'm not a racist, right? And not racist is very different than being anti-racist, right? And so what's the work to say, look, I know that these systems exist and I'm against those systems. And I don't want, I want against it because you know the history and you, and you don't feel that we need to continue to generate policies, practices, and procedures that continue to reinforce those systems. So your commitment is, I'm gonna be anti, I'm against it. I'm just not, not racist means I'm gonna just, I'm not racist, I'm not gonna do anything. And so you're just reinforcing the system. And so what's the work you're willing to do to be anti, against it? And so if you're committed, if you see this history and know this is where we are, then the work is, I'm anti-racist. And so if you're anti-racist, that's very different than saying, what's the work I need to do to make sure that we not, and we're not continuing to see racist policies continue to reinforce the decisions that our city is making? So I hope that makes sense. It's a lot to sit with, but I'm hoping that as, as those are listening in, that helps you as you're thinking about that. Okay. All right, Leon, what do you believe is the next step or what we could be doing now at this time? Well, I, I want to first just commend you, Mayor, for your commitment to this space. And, you know, these are uncomfortable conversations, you know, and, and just want to appreciate you, Mayor, for your willingness to create this space to bring in the community and to just acknowledge that all of us have been taught not to talk about this, right? We have. We've, uh, we have, we've been talking not to talk about race and racism. Um, and, so, and so if we think about the fact that we've been taught that, the question is how do we do the work to, to undo that? And what's the work we need to do as a community? And, I, and for Kankakee, I, uh, I, I can continue to support your efforts to try to figure out how you have these conversations to get comfortable talking about race. Um, and it's not easy because we have not been taught to do it and, 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 and unfortunately, given how our brains work, as I was sharing earlier about the neuroscience, you know, we are, a lot of the stuff we've learned about race has happened in the unconscious part of our brains, right? And so we know that and, and are committed to trying to figure out how we disrupt it, then how do you create the space to continue to do more of these conversations? and to continue to talk about it. And as you start to then talk about it, get comfortable talking about it, then you can start to say, what can we do about it? You can't start to doing, you can't start pivoting to doing something if you're not comfortable talking about it, getting uncomfortable. And that takes work in the work that you do and with, as a community to willing to do that. But as you start to do that work and start to get comfortable, then the, what can we do about it? Then there are tools out there. How do you use a racial equity tool to then start to look at how you're looking at your policies, how you're having the conversations that you need to have? How do you think about how do you organize differently as a city 
that is centering racial equity in this work. And, and, and that, that's part of the journey. And then so just knowing that what you're doing right now is so important because you're laying such a strong foundation as a community to try to figure out how to, how to have these conversations. And again, having these conversations doesn't mean that everybody's on the same page. Um, it, it acknowledges that everyone has different perspectives about this. And so if, if you're willing to engage and willing to be a part of this work, then part of what you're doing is saying, look, we're coming together realizing we may, we may differ, but we're creating a space to acknowledge each other, acknowledge our humanity, acknowledge the fact that I have experienced race, you've experienced race, all of us have experienced race, and we're trying to understand how we've experienced it as this social political construct. And as we try to understand it together, we're committed to trying to figure out what we can do together. And that's part of the journey that you have to be committed on. And no one person, I want to be very clear, there's no one person, no one city that has figured this out. <laughs> Everybody's on this journey together. Even for cities that have been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years, they're still on this journey. It's a journey. And you got to be committed to being on that journey and leaning into the uncomfortable conversation. So we did have a couple more comments. Someone said this was very informative and we need more white people to commit to being anti-racist. And then someone else said, uh, the person that said, so how do two white police officers sue the city saying it was racism? They then said white people insisting on being privileged. Great presentation. So those are the other comments. Are we looking to wrap up now? I think so. I think okay. we're in a good space for that. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I've started having this conversation in the city of Kankakee about equity and, you know, talking about neighborhoods. And um, we have seven wards in our city, and you can clearly see certain wards in the city of Kankakee have not had investment in decades. And as a result of that, those wards tend to have um, the property values aren't as high, the infrastructure is crumbling. Um, crime uh, rates are higher in those neighborhoods. And so I want us to learn about this together as a community and particularly as leaders because we are the ones that are the decision makers for our residents who live here. And so if we, if we look at the data and we learn about what is happening, then we can start to influence and change um, some of the, sy the systems that affect the residents. So, you know, I was really, you know, when you talk about generational wealth, you know, I heard a lot of black families say that every generation we're starting over. You know, we never accumulate wealth, it's never passed down. Um, you know, the housing component, I know my team that works in housing will be really interested, um, interested in hearing their feedback. And, you know, they mentioned earlier about unions, how they wouldn't let African Americans in. And I share my own personal story. My husband was the first black iron worker in the city of Kankakee, and that was only 20 years ago. You know, so when you talk about access, having access to jobs that pay well and that have benefits, you know, these are very real issues that we, that we have lived through right here in the city of Kankakee and still see the, um, the impact of, the, of that. So I wanna thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, thank Mr. Leon Andrews, who's our direct, the Director of Racial Equity and Leadership with the National League of Cities, and Ms. Shante Byers, who's the Senior Executive and Director of Member and Partner Engagement for the National League of Cities. Thank you all for leading all of us throughout this country on this important work. Um, the pandemic has exposed even more inequity. When you have people that you know tend to be in lower paying jobs, women, minorities that they cannot work from home. They don't have you know those jobs where they can do that. Um, and just some of the other inequities that we see, you know, with you know uh, those uh, groups. So I want to encourage you all to just you know process this information. Reach out to us here at the city. Reach out to me. I want to hear your thoughts, and I want us to continue to do this work together. Because if we improve the parts of the community that are struggling and start addressing some of these issues, um, it will make the community safer, healthier, and we will thrive. 
Um, you can follow us on the City of Kankakee's website, citykankakee-il.gov. We are also on um, social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and I, we encourage you to subscribe to our City of U, uh, Kankakee YouTube channel. So we will sign off. It's a late night. You guys are in D.C. an hour ahead of us, so I really appreciate you guys um, starting this conversation with our city, and we will be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you a good night. Have a good night, everybody. Take care. Take care. Be well.